So Edie Falco, you are uh, back in the Emmy race for your performance in Law and Order True Crime, The Menendez Murders. Uh, you play Leslie Abramson. Uh, I'm curious, you know, this Menendez brothers trial was something that really galvanized the country and it inspired a lot of strong opinions on, uh, you know, on a lot of different topics. So when you first got approached about this, what were your expectations like for the series? Well, uh, I can't say I had any expectations for the series. I just know that my interest was piqued um, because what I learned from Dick Wolf and all the people at his company that did all this um, research was that I was I couldn't have been more wrong about my my perception of the story, um, and to imagine that I was not alone in that um, was intriguing to me. That maybe we could. Uh, set the record straight because I think it's an important story and also to imagine that it's probably not the only story where we have been fed the information that sort of tells the story that they want told. You know what I mean? Right. Can you talk a bit more about that, how your perceptions of it were changed by what you found out through the show? Well, yeah, I thought, you know, the, the news cycle was not what it is now. So whenever it was in the evening that we heard the news, um, it was about these two spoiled rich kids in Beverly Hills who killed their parents. And that was kind of how I filed it away in my brain. And, uh, you know, once I, uh, the more I learned about it, the more I realized it was, uh, you know, pretty plain and simple, a story about child abuse. Right. Now you play Leslie Abramson, the defense attorney, um, who became a controversial figure in her own right. Um, there was a lot of stuff about her in the media. So I wonder, uh, what was your approach to that character? You know, it was the same as it is to any character. You know, I just tried to find out what it is that was her through line in this story. Uh, you know, where she was coming from, what did she care about? Um, what was her viewpoint? How did she go about getting her point across? Like kind of the same thing I would do, even if it was a, you know, fictional character. And you mentioned, I mean, there's this push and pull uh, that happened during the trial and uh, is still talked about today between uh, this perception about the Menendez brothers. On the one hand, people saying that they were spoiled rich kids. On the other hand, people saying they were victims of child abuse. And there is still this passionate kind of defense of either argument. Your character really is uh, obviously on one side of that, on the, the child abuse uh, uh perception of it. Can you talk a bit more about how that relates to your character? Well, I, you know, also based on everything I learned in preparation for this, um, it seems pretty clear. There is no question that it was about uh, that these kids were, were, were abused in a very big way. And not only that, their parents were abused. So there was a cycle of abuse going down through the generations, which is pretty much how it happens unless somebody you know, uh, does something about stopping it, I don't know, therapy or whatever, to put an end to the cycle. Um, it seems pretty clear to me, people were coming out of the woodwork after a while to say, well, I kind of suspected this, but I didn't know for sure, you know, that there were people, allegations all over the place that this had been going on in that household. And people were either told to shut up or they were told that they were uh, exaggerating or, um, uh, unclear about what they had seen or what they had heard, but it seems to me um, that this really did happen. Because even when I first, my first meeting with Dick Wolf, he was talking about it and I said, yeah, but did this stuff really happen? And he said, there's no question. So I don't, and that is the way I, I went about this, you know, um, unless all the research is dead wrong, I am going to assume that that's the case. And, and also I assume that that's what Leslie was feeling. Well, I mean, speaking of the real person, uh, in terms of your own research, what did you do? I mean, did you meet with her? Did you look at, uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, video out there of her because this was highly televised. So, so what did you do on your own? Well, there is a lot of video, but certainly less than if it was happening now. You'd be surprised. You know, there was some video of her, at, you know, speaking to reporters outside the courthouse and stuff like that. Uh, it was not of great import to me to do a physical uh, imitation of her, you know, because it was for me more about where she was coming from. I, I mean, you could say, oh, the, 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 the defense attorney with the curly hair and people, oh yeah, I, I know her. But it's not like they're so familiar with how she looked and how she walked and how she talked that it would, that it was important to, 
to uh, imitate that. I also, it's a very strange thing playing a real person and playing a real person who's still alive. You know, it's, I want to have respect for this very difficult chapter she went through in her life. So I, I you know, I, I, I want to tread lightly basically is what it was. I just wanted to get what she was, what she was going for there and understand her point of view. And that's, you know, I was able to read lots of stuff, including her own book um, and get an idea of who she was and what she cared about. Right. And a lot of that contributes to, you know, I mean, as you said, there's not as much video of her as there would be today. Right. But I mean, certainly there was enough of her and, and certainly enough of the Menendez brothers to create a public perception in people's minds. And, you know, the show does a really good job of burrowing underneath and seeing what was going on in their private lives. So can you talk about, I guess, that public persona versus that private persona? Was there, did you find a difference between those or? With Leslie, you mean? Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, the private persona, a um, little more difficult because it was all, um, to a large degree, in, in Rene Balsay's imagination and based on uh, things he himself had learned about her. But what they have transcripts of are, are her, you know, her, her court documents and things that she did um, when she was defending um, these guys. So the other stuff is kind of like connecting the dots. You're making assumptions about, well, she, you know, this, the scene may have gone something like this, or you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the part I imagine is, is, is uh, most difficult, most challenging, and maybe most fun for the writer of a piece like this, where you have to kind of create a, uh, you know, a full, fully dimensional person out of little pieces. Right. And she went through her own legal troubles herself with, uh, you know, the incidents with, uh, I believe it's Eric's psychiatrist um, and some of the things that they had talked about. Um, I'm curious if you could talk a bit about playing that aspect of it. Well, you know, uh, again, based on the research, what that was is it says that she had changed the wording of uh, some of the transcripts that came from uh, the psychiatrist based on his meetings. And um, it, I think that's not really the case. You know, it, it, you know, there are 50 million people and 50 million versions of this, but from her own words in her book, she said basically he'd write in chicken scratch and that she, it was very hard to kind of figure out what he actually said. And that in changing the wording, it was more about making it clear. And I don't, you know, not to defend her because I, you know, this was not part of our story per se, but it seemed to me that it was not, uh, it's, it's more about intention. And I don't think there was any malintent on her part. I really think she was just trying to clarify things. Well, you're right about one thing. It is very hard to read doctor's handwriting, having, uh, yes. been, to, <laughs> having been to a few in my lifetime. Um, <laughs> um, I would... Can you talk, was there a particular moment that you can point to throughout these eight episodes that was really difficult to play? Or, I mean, an example of something that maybe was a challenge to you as an actor? Well, you know, a lot of it was difficult because um, it's an awful, awful story. And as I am the mother of a boy and a girl, but this was about boys, um, you know, the, these are the people they go to for support and comfort and safety. And these were the people perpetrating these crimes against them. It's just the most awful kind of thing you can do to a human, you know, uh, to make them feel unsafe, to literally be unsafe in their home environment, where, which is supposed to be the scaffolding on which they build a life. So, um, and certainly, I guess it was the, her, her, um, her finished her, her, oh my gosh final statement, whatever, I can't think of what it's called all of the a sudden. Summation. Summation, yes. Where she goes through talking about what her father, what the father would do to him. Uh, it was just, it was awful. And she was very professional. You would, you know, it was important for me not to let on how much this touched me personally. Um, because at least in that particular time, it was not entirely appropriate. But it was, it, that, it was challenging at times. It was just, uh, you know, infuriating and hard, you know, just a difficult situation all around because the parents were sick, you know, mm -hmm. but the kids bore the brunt of that. And, and in those moments, uh, you know, you, there's a great team of directors on the show, starting with uh, Leslie Linker Gladder and, and on down uh, the showrunner and also Dick Wolf. I mean, what do they give you that helps, um, you, you know, get you through those moments? Um, I, you know,
know, they, it's hard to say. Cause I, I mean, I, I've been doing this a very long time. So for the most part, I kind of keep my own counsel on those types of things. Um, it, it was, a, there were a lot of nuts and bolts in the storytelling of this. And that was what the directors were there for. Uh, I mean, among other things, creating shots and creating the mood of the set and all that stuff. But as far as my own performance and that kind of thing, you know, if I felt like I needed help, I would ask. But for the most part, I felt like I kind of knew what I was doing. And if I was off the mark, they would tell me. It gets a little uh, little easier over time, I suppose, to find yeah. that kind After, of nuance. You have to learn whether or not you can trust yourself with these things. Right. Um, you know, we're in this golden age of television, and uh, you were a part of a, a couple of shows that really helped, uh, you know, kick that off, uh, starting with Oz and then The Sopranos, which you won three Emmys for. I wonder if you could, uh, first off, reflect a bit about the, I guess, the sense of, I don't know, discovery or freedom or, you know, whatever it was that made those shows so revolutionary and then led to, you know, I mean, things like, like this show where you're you're taking something that maybe 30 years ago wouldn't have had the kind of depth and nuance that it has today. You know, as I, as I was working on all these shows over the years, I, I had no perspective. You know what? I still don't. As far as where those shows fit into the lexicon of television and, you know, it started a thing. And the truth is I've learned this by watching shows like CNN's, you know, two, the two, two, two thousands or whatever. Right. Like I don't, I still cannot see clearly um, where each of these shows fit into the world. I have to read about it, you know? I was more than anything else, just thrilled to be working, to be working on something where I loved going to work every day, where the writing was great. I loved being with my fellow actors and crew people. That's the only, you know, awareness I had about it. And, you know, I kept, I went into this business where I kept hearing, you know, it's very hard for, women, you know, women, roles for women are harder to come by and all that. I just never found any of that to be true for me. And I, I feel like I've just been blessed in so far as my particular journey in this business, um, that I've been exceedingly lucky to find the roles that I've found and to work with the people that I've worked with. Well, certainly Carmela Soprano is one of those great roles. Uh, you won three Emmys for that show, including in the first season uh, on your very first nomination. Uh, what did that kind of recognition mean for you? The whole thing is a blur, to be honest with you. Um, I didn't quite know what any of it meant. We were all like shot out of a cannon, you know. We all went from New York City theater actors with no money and and you know little uh, fifth floor walk up apartments to getting a ton of attention. And and um, I don't know if anyone has a slow, easy rise to something like that, but we certainly didn't. So I was told go here, and I went there. You know, you show up for this thing and then you get a dress for this thing and then you come back to work on this day. So it really was, again, without any kind of outside view of what was actually going on. You just do the best you can to keep your head above water and remember to constantly be grateful because um, the whole thing has been such a gift, truly, uh, to get to do something I love as much as I love this and to do stuff that people watch. I don't know. been very, very lucky. You also won an Emmy for your work on Nurse Jackie. I actually did an interview uh, earlier with your co-star on that, Merritt Weaver. It's pretty nicely we got this little Nurse Jackie reunion at the I end. I know, and, uh, and uh, Betty Gilpin, too. That's right, yes, yes. Um, I, I hope you all three get to uh, spend some time reflecting on that or maybe present an award or something. <laughs> I do. Um, I wonder if you could just reflect a bit about, uh, you know, going off of The Sopranos, such a high watermark for any actor, and then to be able to get uh, another great role, a very different kind of role uh, immediately after that. I never really know, uh, like I don't have a great idea about, you know, what's the next best move for my career. After, you know, I, I have a completely, uh, I'm going on a visceral sense about what is interesting to me because I, I, I'm not great at working on stuff that doesn't actually interest me. So from a totally selfish standpoint, um, that's where I was coming from when it came to reading stuff after The Sopranos. And yes, of course, it was uh, a little disheartening for a while because it seemed like there was a lot of stuff that just did not speak to me. Um, and uh, when I first read Nurse Jackie, it was very different. It was much darker, um, but there was something about the character that I really responded to and it underwent a bunch of changes. And so, you know, that's, you never really know. And once I shot the pilot, I thought, I don't know, will people watch this? Who knows? Whoever knows with this stuff, you know? 
but uh you know the 10 years on uh, sopranos and 10 years on jackie and uh, you know luckiest person around uh, well you certainly had another great role to add to that uh list of uh of great television roles edie falco thank you so much congratulations on your emmy nomination and uh, thank you for the time thank you have a good one